Good evening, welcome to Drink Lab. My name is Clay and I'm coming to you from the bar here at Loretta's Larder at Pier 15 and I am extremely excited because tonight we are going to go from data to action and create the world's most popular cocktail. It will be called the Perfect Ven and you say, Clay, how can you know what will be the world's most popular cocktail? Well, I know that to be true because the data says so. Uh, tonight's theme from data to action is going to uh, inspire us to create something that we hope you enjoy at home. We know we've been enjoying it here and it is called the Perfect Ben. Uh, and what we've done is we've taken a, uh, the data from around the globe of what are the most popular cocktails year to year that are ordered globally and we've looked at those and seen the overlaps and the commonalities and the differences and the contrasts of all the different flavors that are represented and we're going to pick out uh, what works together and create um, the perfect vent. So luckily for us uh, a lot of the data work has already been done. There is a, a trade pub publication that annually goes out and surveys about 130 different bars around the globe to find out what are their most popular cocktails uh, on a uh, year in year out and um, we have that data from the last five years so interestingly uh, number one and number two have stayed constant number one being the old-fashioned uh, and whiskey based drink and number two being uh, Negroni uh, which is a great uh, gin based drink um, the other three slots, three, four, and five, have been filled by four cocktails, uh, and they've just kind of changed places for the last five years. I think even longer than that. And th those are um, Whiskey Sour, Manhattan, Gin Martini, and the Daiquiri. So you, annually, we usually have two to three whiskey drinks, a couple gin drinks, and then the rum Daiquiri uh, outlier kind of comes in and off, on and off the list. So um, when we looked at all of this data and we saw where things overlapped and started to think about how do we want to make this cocktail, um, the first thought was to you know, mix one part whiskey, one part gin. Uh, but when you do that, you tend to lose uh, the nuance and the integrity of the, the individual spirits. Um, they get muddy the more stuff you put in. Um, so I was, I was kind of stuck at the beginning, if you will, until uh, a light bulb went off and uh, I was reminded of a spirit that was popular many, many years ago uh, and has fell out of favor and now has kind of been resurrected a little bit over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and that is um, basically the original style of gin. Um, Jennifer from like the 1600s in, in, in Holland an old tom gin which was more like uh, the 17 1800s in uh, US, in america and what these are um, are spirits that are made with a whiskey uh, base meaning um, usually malted barley or corn or some type of grain that you find in a whiskey mash bill but they're infused with the aromatics that you uh, know of from gin, from today's London Dry Gin. Juniper, citrus, um, some of the other herbs and, and, uh, and distillates that are used uh, today. So this is like the perfect mashup of whiskey and gin. Um, Old Tom tends to be a little bit lighter on the oak, uh, which is also a, uh, a flavor component found in whiskey. Whereas this barrel-aged Jennifer is a little more oak heavy. This sees about 18 months in uh, oak barrels. So for the perfect Ven, we're going to use the, uh, the longer aged Jennifer because it's a little closer to the whiskey end of the spectrum. And from year to year, the data shows that whiskey tends to be uh, more, more highly represented. Um, so we're going to use Jennifer gin. Then we're also going to use sweet and dry vermouth, hence the perfect uh, the use of the word perfect. Perfect Manhattans, perfect martinis, those are classic cocktails that are made with sweet and dry vermouth both. And um, you found this, these spirits on the list. 
You also found flavors from dry present here. They work really well together. Um, so we're going to use these two vermouths. And then the final piece of the puzzle was try to, how are we going to introduce citrus, which is used in the whiskey sour um, and in the daiquiri, without overpowering um, the subtleties of the vermouths and even of the spirit itself, the Jennifer. And um, we decided to do that by making our own bitters uh, because the bitters, whether they be orange bitters, Angostura bitters, were also very prevalent on the list. Uh, there's a, tons of tutorials and great videos online about how to make your own bitters. I really recommend you experiment with it. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to put a signature on a drink uh, and the, it's, it's really pretty simple. Um, again, we're going to make a citrus driven version. Uh, the cool thing was I was also able to throw a little bit of the rum flavor in with, from the daiquiri which is on the list by using overproof rum as the base for the bitters. The perfect Ben, statistically proven to be the world's most popular cocktail. Um, first thing we're going to do is add two ounces of the Jennifer. Uh, again, I went with the longer aged spirit, longer oak aged spirit to give us a little bit of that, a little bit more of that whiskey punch along with the gin botanicals. Then we're going to do equal parts of sweet and dry vermouth. Half ounce of sweet, a half ounce of dry. Then we are going to add our uh, bitters. Uh, we're going to use Angostura because it was, it was very prevalent on the list and it, and it, it adds a warm spice aromatic to your cocktail. So a healthy dash of Angostura and then two dashes of our homemade citrus bitters. Add your ice. Give it a stir. Remember we're cooling and diluting here at the same time which is going to make this much more palatable and appropriate for sipping. Then we take our pre-chilled cocktail glass and you can use uh, any, anything you, any glass you want, martini, coupe glass, uh, just a rocks glass, uh, but we are going to drink this neat. Um, most of the cocktails on the list are served um, up. There are a few that are on the rocks. Uh, but this cocktail, the Perfect Vent, I think is, is really well suited for sipping. Um, one last finish, I like to reserve some of the dried orange uh, citrus peels from the bitters that we made and use that as a garnish because it's uh, visually cool and also uh, it rehydrates as it sits in your cocktail which means you get a kind of an evolution of flavor uh, over the course of drinking the cocktail. The world's most popular cocktail is available to purchase at LorettasLarder.com. Come visit us. There's other cocktails available there as well along with our delicious menus posted every Sunday afternoon. And this is definitely a sipper. Uh, so the perfect Ven from data to action. Cheers, have a great night. Hi, my name is Jennifer Frazier and I'm a scientist at the Exploratorium. Thank you for joining us for tonight's After Dark, From Data to Action. Tonight, you'll hear three stories about how data is helping us better understand our world. First, we'll learn how interpreting COVID-19 data can help us make better health decisions. Next, we'll see how data about soil contamination can empower citizens in their gardens. Finally, we'll learn how personalizing climate change data can drive action. Even as I speak to you, billions of pieces of data have been collected about our natural world, from genome sequencing machines to buoys in the ocean to the satellites above. At the Exploratorium, we've created hands-on exhibits that help our visitors better understand their world through data. With tonight's program, we hope that we can give you some new tools to help you better explore and question the data that you encounter at home. And so let's get started. I'm excited to introduce our first guest, Amanda McCulloch. Amanda has been one of the leading voices 
in thinking about and questioning COVID-19 data. Amanda has a master's in public health from Boston University and spent eight years working with data in global health programs. Amanda is currently the data visualization lead at Excella, a technology firm in Washington, DC, and she's the operations director for the nonprofit Data Visualization Society. Please join me in welcoming Amanda McCulloch. Hi, my name is Amanda McCulloch, and I am going to be speaking to you today about the hidden complexities of visualizing COVID-19. I'm excited to bring some of my background in both public health and in data visualization design to hopefully help demystify a few of the coronavirus charts that you've seen floating around your news feeds or on different news outlets that you've been exploring. So let's dig into it. Let's explore the hidden complexities of visualizing COVID-19. So as we go ahead and we think about the various ways that we look at this data, we see COVID-19 data everywhere. We see these charts and graphs popping up on our social media feeds. We see them in various news outlets like the New York Times, Reuters, the Financial Times, and others. And we talk about them as we think about big decisions like sending our kids back to school and other big policy decisions that these numbers are impacting. The COVID crisis has really generated a real need to understand and communicate vital information about data, models, and outcomes in ways that we've seldom seen before on a global scale. And as Steve Drucker said, we've needed that data in order to persuade, to understand current conditions, and to predict future outcomes based on the various behaviors that we're embodying. There's a lot of the pieces of COVID-19 that require not just policy action, but individual choices, which is why this data has become so important and meaningful to many of us as we go about our day-to-day -day lives. COVID-19 charts typically appear pretty simple and straightforward. I did a quick meta-analysis with a few students as part of the BU SPH COVID core, and we looked at 37 different sources of COVID-19 data and tracking. And across 251 charts, when we classified them by chart type, Here's what we found, mainly line charts, maps, bar charts, tables, things that are pretty straightforward and easy to understand, we think. Using these common chart types actually helps make information more widely accessible. Many of us have seen a line chart or a bar chart before in our lives, and we have a sense of how we might interpret it. As that line goes up, we can intuit that some kind of metric is increasing. But even on what seems like a simple line chart, here looking at cumulative confirmed COVID-19 cases in the US, compared to many other countries around the world, kind of fading in the back there in gray, you can see that there's a few unique features that you may not see on typical line charts. Looking at the x-axis, we see that along the x-axis isn't a timeline, January, February, March. Instead, we've normalized the data or indexed the data such that it's based on the days since the 100th confirmed case in a given country. This better lets us compare a country like China with an early start to their epidemic with a country like the US. We also see that there's a toggle on the top for a linear or a log scale, and never as a data viz professional did I expect log scales to be in wide usage across different data journalism outlets. But log scales change the way the y-axis is structured such that we actually, with a disease that spreads exponentially, can actually see the shape of the curve a bit better. It doesn't appear like a hockey stick that goes straight up as those numbers increase. We also see more novel displays that allow us to see patterns across thousands of data points. Looking at this simple heat map where we're looking at data by state with US deaths by state by day, you actually are looking at over 7,500 data points all plotted in one central view. And what's amazing is that visualizations let us see patterns in that data. You can see those dark boxes for New York up in the top around April. And annotation layers have been used to help us read charts that really may feel unfamiliar. This stream graph here gives us a sense of when the death toll from COVID-19 was the greatest around the world and what the shape of that death toll has looked like in a, a different way than looking at a line chart or a bar chart. And there's a clear annotation layer that has additional information. So as of the day when we're going ahead and looking at this data here, August 5th, we can see that there's a note that says a surge in Latin America means global daily death toll is on the rise once again. Even if you're not sure how to interpret or read this specific chart, the designer is giving you keys and clues here in the text annotations, which are really valuable. And the Financial Times team has done a tremendous job in adding these annotation layers to help enable broader understanding. When we create visualizations though, we really are implying a certain degree of factfulness and objectivity to what we're sharing. When you see a line chart and it's going up or a bar chart that's 
over time showing a decline or a comparison of cases that go down. We infer that there's some certainty to those numbers and that's why they've been plotted. And this creates a challenge for us as data visualization designers when we're visualizing incomplete, messy data sets like data on an emerging new disease. So let's talk today a bit about how we can better understand the data underneath these charts and how we can actually be a little bit more critical consumers of those charts and graphs, understanding those hidden complexities. Let's take a really simple chart that we've seen on a number of different coronavirus trackers. This example here is from the New York Times, but you can find similar charts in a number of other spaces. You'll see the light red bars in the background that indicate daily new cases, and then you'll see a rolling average line that shows the seven-day average. This gives us more of a smoothed out trend that helps us see the overall trajectory of the epidemic here in the US. Now, digging in a little bit more, we can see a few things that may be cause for just pause and thinking about what does that really mean? We see at the bottom that there's a note that this includes both confirmed and probable cases where available. Now that gets important in how we're actually quantifying and defining what's included in the chart. And as the case count has grown over time, that may become less notable as more and more states and places include probable cases, but it's still important to think about. We also see some noise in those bars, which is why the smooth rolling average trend line is really helpful for us. That noise isn't really meaningful differences in increases and declines in COVID-19. It's likely just reporting noise. You can see it's quite cyclical and we see that dip every seven-ish days. And that's related to reporting lags, not to actual changes in the epidemic. So what questions can we ask ourselves to become slightly more informed consumers of some of these charts and graphs that we're seeing every day and to start to unpack what they actually mean? First, we can focus on how COVID-19 case data is actually collected. Understanding how data sets are collected and created can help us actually have a little bit more empathy for the challenges that happen when collecting data on something like an emergent disease. So first, let's talk about how we define a case. Going back to that case classification definition of probable cases versus confirmed cases. And reading different documents from the CDC might seem really in the weeds if you're just trying to make sense of COVID-19 near you. But it's helpful to know, for example, if your state is including probable cases in your case counts and if the state next to you is doing the same or not. Because if you're including both probable, these cases that may have been confirmed with a clinical diagnosis, but not with a laboratory test, um, confirming, including probable cases, you're going to find that number gets bigger than if we only include confirmed cases. And as we think about making more apples to apples comparisons as best we can, we want to make sure that we're defining a case the same way. We also have to think about how that definition has changed over time. So here you see a table that includes different case definitions over different periods in China. This is in the early three, first three months of the pandemic and looking at the ways in which case definitions changed. The more dots you see in a given period, version one, two, three, eventually to version five, the more dots you see, the more ways that someone can actually classify someone who is ill and infected as a COVID-19 case. Now, this may seem like one of those, again, in the weeds epidemiologic surveillance issues, but what it does for us as data consumers is it can create big spikes in what the data actually looks like. So we see here, right in that midpoint of that change in the definition, where all those new dots appeared, there was a new classification that actually allowed us, as you see with those little blue dots, to go ahead and have more ways of classifying cases with clinical evidence, which then caused us to have a huge spike in reported cases for that given day. It's not that there was a meaningful change in the epidemic in China, it's, a, it's that there was a change in the way that we could classify cases and do reporting. This is why getting in the weeds of those numbers can be helpful. So when you see these kind of spikes or anomalies, you can start to investigate why they happen. We also have to think about how we actually collect data. And there's various reporting forms from the WHO or CDC because of the fact that COVID-19 is a globally reportable disease. And these collect a number of different fields about the patient and about the patient's background, history, and the case itself. But who actually collects this data? And how does that data move from someone filling out one of these forms to actually going ahead and having a record in a database? This is where actually understanding that journey can be really helpful. 
So I'm going to take you on a journey back to my hometown in Rockford, Illinois. This uh, journey map of confirmed COVID-19 cases was done as part of a series of interviews I did with different people around the world doing COVID-19 uh, testing and case data collection. And so you can see that we start with someone driving up to the drive up site to go ahead and get their test swab taken. They fill out a form in the car. The swab gets taken and the patient gets entered into a spreadsheet. All of this kind of happens at the testing site before anything goes off to the lab. Then we move into our little purple phase. And we see that the lab was uh, about three and a half hours away where the swab was sent to go ahead and be processed, get the results and enter the data into the Illinois State Database. Now you can start to think, well, what if the person who got tested doesn't live in Illinois? My hometown's 10 minutes south of the border from Wisconsin. And a number of the folks coming to these testing sites are from other states. Somehow that data has to make it back to say the Wisconsin registry or to Indiana. Then the results get sent back to the testing site, um, in this case via an e-fax system. The testing site spreadsheet's updated and sent to the county health department and the patient gets notified. Oftentimes when we think about COVID-19 data, we tend to think of data just kind of popping up based on test results and don't unpack that process. And as you can see, a number of different people, places, and information systems are involved. So we can have a bit more empathy for the complexity of reporting this data, especially in a very decentralized information system like we have in the US. Now, if we go ahead and we move over to uh, South Africa, for example, where I spoke to a colleague there, they collect all of their COVID-19 data through one integrated mobile application that can connect to their national health information system. That simplifies this process a lot. And they have the advantage of also having a large number of community health workers doing outreach and home visits to identify who needs to go for testing. At the point of the interview back in May, we found that this whole process was estimated to only take 48 hours compared to taking, I mean, a couple days for test results to even be returned back in the example we saw in Illinois. So as we look at case data in different countries and we think about how epidemics progress, it's important to think about the ways in which how data gets collected can create changes in what that epidemic shape looks like and how real time that data really is. So if we start digging into the charts themselves, once we've collected all of this data and looked at what's displayed, what is actually represented in the charts or what's not? How real time are those daily case counts is the first question I tend to tackle with teams and folks when I'm talking to them about COVID-19 data. And they're looking at real time data that they're seeing on these trackers that's popping up. Well, so remember the journey map of how we looked at how case data got collected from a, a provider perspective, what that looked like going through the test collection, the laboratory, the information system. Let's think about what that looks like from a patient perspective. So an illustrative timeline of a positive COVID-19 test from exposure over to test result. Say you go to a large gathering or an event where you're worried you may have been exposed to COVID-19. There are varying recommendations that generally recommend you wait five to seven days to go get tested because you need to see if you uh, develop the disease, become symptomatic or not, um, and have a high enough viral load to actually test positive and not end up with a uh, false negative test result. During that time, you're potentially pre-symptomatic. You could unknowingly infect others, so you should still be cautious about your day-to-day -day activities. You go get tested on day seven, for example, in our timeline. And then it takes back in June in DC, where I am, it took three to five days to go from test to result that actually gave me an answer on if I was positive or not. And if I'm asymptomatic or can't quite tell if I'm sick, that's a period during which I still am not sure if I actually am COVID positive. Then finally, I might get the test results. And remember that in the last month or so, we've seen results taking seven or more days to come back and be returned. So the expectation there is that someone is functionally self-quarantined for two weeks, which can be really challenging if you're in a position where you don't have a house that can accommodate having your own bathroom or you're dealing with challenges of childcare. And so all of these different lags that happen in these different points in time are important to understand because the data point you're looking at on that chart from the New York Times or somewhere else for the daily case count is based on the day the results were received, not the day the swab was taken and not the day someone was infected. So we're already looking at a story of COVID-19 on a bit of a lag once we start seeing those results get returned. When we zoom out a bit more, we have to remind ourselves how important it is to take these different public health steps in terms of staying safe, wearing masks, physically distancing, and washing hands. And I'd be remit as a public health professional to not remind folks of how important that is in the midst of a global pandemic. When we go ahead and think about what those lags in reporting can mean, take testing, for example, and test results, they can impact the data we see. The New York Times has done a great job of actually highlighting on some of their state charts 
where there are data anomalies. So you see these yellow bars and some annotations about where probable data was released. Here we see that on April 24th, the state actually reported the results of a large number of backlog tests. So we had tests that were done between April 13th and 24th, all logged on that same day. When we get those updated test results, we log them the day the results are received for the most part, not the day when the swab was taken or the day the test was originally run, which is why you see these big spikes. And the second piece is where we come back to our probable versus confirmed cases um, issue of how we define cases. And we added a lot of probable cases in Massachusetts on June 1st. We also have to think about the ways in which no single measure can tell us everything we need to know. We've talked a lot today about cases and case counts. And a lot of those numbers are important to understand the spread of the virus. We also can look at different ways of looking at measures around cases or other data and trying to answer key questions, like how is the disease spreading, which is the question this map from COVID exit strategy is trying to answer. And instead of plotting actual case counts on this map, they've gone ahead and actually plotted the percent change of cases over the last 14 days. So I understand the trend in the number, not the actual cumulative number itself. They even give me additional information and additional data points that I can scroll down and view about each individual state that further gives me more information, which is really what I need to know. So if I'm sitting here in Washington, DC, the question I ask myself is, what additional metrics do I really need in order to inform my own risk level of contracting COVID-19 and kind of going about my day-to-day -day life? And on the COVID Act Now website, they give a nice layout of five different metrics to look at. And these different metrics tell us different things. Daily new cases helps tell us a bit about spread and containment. Infection rate, or r naught tells us how many new people will be infected for every one infected person. We want to get that down under one. Positive test rate gives me a sense of if we are testing enough people, and we'll dig into that in a minute. And then ICU headroom used and contacts traced helps me understand the likelihood that I can get treated if I was to get sick. Are the hospitals available to me? And how well are we doing at containing the spread by tracing contacts of those who are infected? And if we dig in, for example, to positive test rate, a key measure of understanding if we're testing enough people, that is a measure that helps us dig in and see uh, whether or not I should be concerned about us only catching the most high risk cases. So if we have a high positive test rate up here in that critical range, it means we're probably not testing enough people. We really want that number to be pretty low. And what's great about some of the charts and graphs out there is that they give you great annotation layers and additional reference lines indicating what you want those numbers to be. Because it can be a bit counterintuitive sometimes with some of these measures, things like positive test rate, where you might not intuit that a low number is good, but it is. It means we're testing lots of people and likely catching more of those asymptomatic cases. We also can look at additional peripheral variables, different things that aren't related specifically to COVID-19 case data itself, but instead tell us more about what's happening in different countries or in different states. So here, excess deaths actually helps us understand the potential impact of COVID-19, where there have been issues of undercounting. So if we saw periods where we weren't testing widely and we weren't counting a lot of people as having COVID-19 or having related mortality, the excess deaths numbers give us a sense of how are we doing this year compared to previous years. And all those little red inchworms, that shading, indicates that the total excess deaths that have occurred during the outbreak itself, which should be concerning to us when that space is really big. So finally, once we kind of dig in and start thinking critically about those charts and graphs and the numbers underneath them, we also have to think about what stories are represented in the charts and graphs we see. There can be a real fatigue and saturation when we're looking at charts and graphs endlessly, the endless upward slope or the bar charts and the line charts and all those pieces. And in all of those aggregate charts, we can lose a bit of the humanity of the reality that each of these numbers represent a person. I don't know if you remember back in March, but there was a really popular simulation that was done by the, uh, the Washington Post by Harry Stevens that did a simulation of why we needed to slow down our activities, social distance, and work to flatten the curve. And one of the reasons that that specific simulation connected with so many people is because each of these little bouncing balls was a person. We could actually kind of see ourselves in this visual, sim uh, visual simulation versus just seeing the final charts and outputs, which is what it just plotted in the area plot um, of change over time at the top that showed us how many people were recovered, healthy, or sick. And by going ahead and making it even a little bit more personal by breaking it out into these small dots, 
we're able to better connect with the underlying data. Don't forget the people who are behind those numbers and that each case or each death represents a person. A way that this gets represented sometimes in really effective ways is to use isotype plots, uh, ways that we go ahead and use small individual people instead of dots that go ahead and actually tell us a story. Here in the Korean clusters from Reuters, you can see the contact tracing done to find different index patients for a given cluster. Here, patient 31. And patient 31, after some contact tracing work that was done, you can see with this diagram, the kind of flow of what happened over time. You can see that that index patient was for this very, very, very large church cluster. And I would argue that this large scrolling body of people in many ways is much more visually impactful to a lot of us than just seeing another very, very, very long bar chart. And so as we think about the ways that we represent information as designers, we also have to think about the ways to represent that humanity. At a local level, looking at DC, for example, we can look at data by ward and start drilling into what's happening geographically near us. And a colleague of mine actually went ahead who was a COVID-19 patient. She submitted a FOIA request to get all of her own data back to find out what data the DC government had collected and then published about her specific case. Obviously anonymous on the public facing website, but she wanted to know where she was in this dashboard of data. And you can see that one of the last things to get added were her demographics. So looking at that data getting added at the end of March, even though she was tested earlier. And so as we think about what that means for us, we have to think about how each of these different aggregate visualizations represent people. And sometimes there are lags in getting the detailed broken down information that we need to better understand the pandemic. Here, things like demographics, like understanding the distribution of cases or deaths by race which we know is a really important thing to look at as we look at COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact on communities of color. And having that data is critical. Looking back to mid-April, I had worked with a colleague to look up how many different states were actually reporting data disaggregated by race by mid-April. We found that 38 states as of April 16th were reporting that data. And in part, I think due to public pressure, we see a lot more states now. Um, as of August 5th, it's 50 of the 56 states and territories reporting race and ethnicity disaggregated data, which better helps us understand who is being disproportionately impacted by the disease and understanding the impact on communities. But even looking at communities themselves and looking at these communities disproportionately impacted, even on summary charts that are very impactful, sometimes doesn't still get us to that underlying story, which is where visualizations like the front cover of the New York Times on May 24th in some ways is one of the most impactful visualizations we've seen of the impact and death toll of COVID-19, focusing not just on an aggregate count or a number or a bar, but really on thinking about who these people were, naming them, giving their age, and giving a short anecdote from their obituary. There are other designers who've gone and found ways to display that in simpler, smaller ways. Here, Georgia Lupi actually reimagined Andrew Cuomo's slides and thought about all of those different deaths as more of kind of a constellation of stars in the sky, where each different dot represents a life lost. And while this may be a much less precise visualization for us to interpret and understand than looking at a bar or a line graph, it is something that helps us connect more to those individual people. So as you go ahead and continue going about your day-to-day -day life, sipping your coffee and reading charts related to COVID-19, remember to think about how is case data collected? How is that data being collected and captured? And how do changes in those data systems and who owns that data impact what data we have access to and what data we can monitor and trust? Think about what is represented in the charts or not. Alberto Cairo has said before that a chart shows as much as it hides in part because of the choices the designer is making around what data to display, where to visualize uncertainty. And finally, think about whose stories are shared, who is represented in the data, who's not represented in the data, and remembering as you're looking at those charts and graphs about all the individual people and their families represented in those numbers. So with that, we'll wrap up for today. I hope that you've gotten some good thinking around the ways in which you can be a bit more of a critical consumer of charts and graphs. And remember that the, there are various caveats of this data. The data is not perfect, but all of this being said today, the data is still useful. We still can use this to understand what's happening in the world around us. So don't take all of these caveats as a reason not to pay attention to the data, but be a little bit more critical as you're thinking about it. And as you're digging into these different metrics, I'd highly recommend taking a read through ProPublica's article, How to Understand COVID-19 Numbers. It's an excellent summary of the various numbers and metrics that you can use to understand the COVID-19 pandemic 
uh, here in the US, but even around the world. So with that, we'll wrap up. If you're interested in learning more about data visualization and want to connect with me and other folks really passionate about this space, feel free to connect with our global community of data viz enthusiasts over at the Data Visualization Society. You can find us on our website or you can find us on social media at Data Viz Society over on Twitter, LinkedIn, and other platforms. With that, we'll wrap up for the day. Thank you so much for your time and I hope you've given a few more considerations to the ways that you can consume these charts and graphs with a little bit more of a constructive lens than you might have 20 minutes ago. Amanda's presentation highlighted a critical question we need to ask when thinking about data, whose stories are being represented? This question is more deeply explored in our next piece about citizens collecting their own data on the safety of the fruits and vegetables that they grow. It is the work of Dr. Monica Ramirez Andriota, an assistant professor of soil, water, and environmental science at the University of Arizona. Monica's research builds citizen science programs and low-cost environmental monitoring tools to increase public participation in environmental health monitoring. Please join me in watching her presentation from a data visualization conference that we hosted at the Exploratorium. All right, thank you. It's uh, great to have met you and I'm honored to be here today. Um, I'm going to, I'm an assistant professor. Uh, yeah, hey, you know, what, I'll go to, you know, 2020 people, 2020, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's just jump right in, right? So I'm an environmental health scientist, and uh, this is what I deal with, right? Environmental contamination is prevalent in the United States. This is a map of all federally designated cleanup sites. And if we think about this in terms of proximity to you, we think about that one in four Americans live within three miles of a hazardous waste site. So this makes me uncomfortable. Uh, there's also a level of complacency we might see in our society. But the big thing is that this is unjust. Okay, and I guess to speak uh, more plainly, this pisses me off. Primarily because we know from a health standpoint that 40, your socioeconomic factors in your physical environment will contribute more to your health outcomes as you age than previously thought. It was thought that you had your genetic makeup and what you were born with was, and your genetics would uh, purely right, dictate your health outcome. And we know that your zip code can be more important than your genetic code. And it is this it, disparity uh, in health outcomes that motivates myself and students and my colleagues. If we think about, right, so what do you do? So people do revitalization efforts. Uh, community gardening is a big deal, right? We know that uh, community gardens or gardening in general can serve as a public health intervention and prevention tactic. We know that it increases access to foods, green space, reduces the cost of foods, and we're actually seeing 37 million households are uh, working and doing uh, vegetable gardening. And so, unfortunately, right, uh, soils can be a sink for pollutants, and this may pose a threat to public health. Well, we do not want this to be the case. I don't want po po like pollution to diminish the public health power of a community garden. And so gardens and uh, research in the lab that I run, uh, we use gardens as hubs for public health intervention and environmental health literacy efforts. <laughs> The first question that's, uh, so I work with these community members, this is uh, in Yavapai County, this is a uh, legacy mining site, where community members asked, are my soils safe? Is it safe for me to consume the vegetables from my garden? If so, how much? This question was posed at an Environmental Protection Agency community meeting. I was there, I was documenting community questions. Afterwards, I went up to those community members and said, that's a great question. I don't have site-specific answers, but would you like to work together? And two years later, I was able to get some money. They were able to network throughout their community, and Garden Roots was launched. The other project that I'll talk about briefly is Project Harvest. So if you think about people are growing foods, we're in Arizona, an arid, semi-arid environment. We harvest rainwater. And this rainwater, uh, people are using this rainwater to irrigate their crops. And they ask the question, hey, Monica, can I, what's the quality of this water? Is it safe for me to use on crops I'm going to eat? That question was also asked in parallel with researchers in my department, and boom, we get a project which is looking at the quality of harvested rainwater. 
So here's a map, here's just showing selected communities. Uh, these are, you can see the names, the top one, Dewey Humboldt, that is not Chester Cheetah's house, right? That is uh, mine tailing waste with about, the average concentration of arsenic is around 3,000 milligrams per kilogram. In general, background soils in that area are around, around 30 milligrams per kilogram. These are aerial shots of Hayden Winkleman with one of the last copper smelters operating in the United States, and Globe Miami, which is an active mine as well. And the top one, Chester Cheetah's house, is legacy and no longer in operation. And I'll also highlight Tucson, Arizona, uh, which or Tucson, which has one of the largest uh, groundwater contamination sites, but is also has uh, other toxic release inventories sites. So when you're working with these community members, you got, there is federal and state government involvement, and they use a risk assessment paradigm to decide cleanup standards. So they identify the hazard, they conduct an exposure assessment, they'll do and compare that exposure to a dose response curve, and then they'll do some mathematical magic and they'll say, okay, based on this, we could expect one out of 100,000 100, people to develop cancer over their lifetime. So this means we need to clean up to blank amount to get their risk a little lower. And so this is the type of framework and cleanup operation that the community members are being exposed to. So to address this, right, um, and to do collaborative or democratize the scientific process to increase public participation in environmental health decision making, co-creation is the route. Uh, here you can see the methodology. Uh, this is methods that I employ based on the expertise of others, um, the scaffolding of knowledge and experience. So the first thing to highlight is aligning research and education with community priority. You plan for the co-management of the project. You engage at as many steps as you possibly can. You incorporate multiple forms of knowledge. This is done through a peer education model, uh, looking at uh, people who share similar social backgrounds or life experiences um, are part of the project. And so in this case, promotoras or community health workers are employed and part of the research team. You share the data and you use a cultural model of risk communication so that the data being shared is, can be readily applied to their experience. So with that, you'll hear about garden roots and you'll hear about project harvest. Garden roots, you can see this is the, uh, the <laughs> methodology from community concern, but for today I'll just highlight the translation of results, um, but you can see visually the multiple steps that go on to carry out this type of work. I highlight community gathering and data sharing events. These are places where we come together, we eat, and we talk about the information. People are, as I stated in one of the open discussions, people are intrinsically and extrinsically motivated to receive this data. They're actively participating in the scientific method, and so they come to this event to get their information and to discuss it with their peers and with the uh, promotoras and other researchers. So components of reporting back environmental health data to participants. Here's some citations, uh, but ultimately, what does the people want? So they ask me, so here you can see descriptive information. What did you find? What did you look for? How much was there? Is that high? Is it safe? Where do I focus my time and efforts on? Where did that chemical come from? And lastly, what can or should I do? And so this is the type of, I guess, the formula when you're the data sharing with these community members. Components of a result booklet, so here I'm highlighting garden roots materials, a letter, important information. The guide to re, uh, reading your results is critical. So in this case, if we looked at the data sharing book for uh, garden roots in Dewey Humboldt, there are concentrations in soil, like arsenic and heavy metal concentrations uh, in soil, vegetables, and water was uh, reported reported how much they could eat at various target risks, and then that allowed them to compare the risk posed by the various exposure routes so they could make a decision on where to reduce their exposure. I also had nutritional content in the vegetables because of course someone was like, Monica, they're gonna stop eating vegetables. And I said, no, I trust that they'll be able to understand the information to actually continue to eat the vegetables but change gardening behavior and practices. And so a big thing that was, uh, you know, so you can imagine, you know, I always like, you know, sitting in the dark with the data, like looking at all the numbers. It's super romantic and awesome, and I wish I had more time to do it. And so I'm basically saying, all right, I'm going to choose this target risk and report how much they can eat from their garden. And then it was like 3 in the morning, and I looked up, and I was like, why am I choosing their target risk? 
So I made these tables, individualized booklets for each participant. Uh, it's your choice to decide at what target risk you want to consume, uh, you want to use to make decisions about how much to eat from your garden. And this really became a good education tool about the risk assessment process. So if you're risk adverse, right, you wanna, you're saying, I want to be the most conservative. I'm going to only, I want one out of a million excess lifetime cancer risk in addition to my existing cancer risk in society. So I'm only going to have one and a half cups of tomatoes from my garden a week. But then in the same meeting, you'll have someone who's like, Psh, I'm good. And they'll be like, one out of 10,000. And you'll say, OK, I bet you're going to make the best salsa because you're making 150 cups. You're going to eat 150 cups of tomatoes. And this became comical, but also the point of explaining how risk assessment is done and unveiling the math behind it all. So here's the graphic, right? But mathematically, it was like showing them, this is the calculation. This is how the decisions are made. And explaining this so they could start to, to increase their capacity and they could start to engage the regulatory agencies in the cleanup process. And at that meeting, participants recalculated their exposure. Because they looked at me and they're saying, OK, you're assuming that I'm going to, uh, here's my, you gave me the concentration of arsenic in my radish, and you think I eat radishes every day? Or you think I eat Brussels sprouts every day? Right? And so that became quickly where they could see how, uh, if they changed the variables in this calculation, how their risk would change. Uh, Garden Roots 2.0, right? This is uh, 20 starting in 2015, also hiring a ma or having a Master's of Fine Arts student part of my work. Uh, we started to do at different uh, visualizations and layouts. Again, giving people a point of comparison and explanation of their units and their results. And in this case, we tried a more topographic or a different way of looking at the data set where the maximum contaminant level, right? So if you're in water, what is the maximum contaminant level for that contaminant under the Safe Drinking Water Act? is presented here in red. Your value would be in green. Other samples in the data would be that shady, sandy gray in the, or brown in the background. And any exceedances would be highlighted in yellow. Uh, so we just actually, this paper was accepted earlier this year of how, what participants gained from this type of data sharing and ways to improve it. Uh, this was also showing vegetable data. There are no standards necessarily in the United States for these contaminants in your foods. There are uh, pesticide residues, but not necessarily some of these heavy metals and um, arsenic particularly. And so we'd compare them to the market basket study, but also uh, the Codex Alimentaris set by the World Health Organization, which are recommended values. Because ultimately, people want to know, is this high? Five minutes. Rock on. Here we go. Perfect for talking about project. So this is wrapping up garden roots of looking at really focusing on soils and the plant and how much they could eat. Uh, with Project Harvest, it's much more uh, circled around the rainwater, right? Um, in this case, with Project Harvest, this is funded by the National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. Uh, and this is looking at, with this data sharing experience, we did uh, randomly, uh, randomly assigned participants to a traditional data viz, which was associated primarily and revolved around a booklet. Then we also had, uh, again, the incorporating the arts, an art student, uh, Dorsey Kaufman, who then took uh, the data set and uh, translated that into uh, vibrations. And so you won't hear about ripple effect, but you will hear about the booklet experience and then ripple effect. So this is what's going on in Project Harvest that will be is being teased out of what learners gain from this intervention of an experiential learning experience. But if we look at what it took to build this puppy, so if anyone stopped by right uh, yesterday, the booklet's a little hefty, right? It's reporting back 33 different um, L, uh, uh, chemicals that could be that we measured in the rainwater. So let's go back to the promotoras. So these guys are the uh, liaisons and the community advocates and my co esteemed colleagues that I love working with each of them. They're each from, uh, they work in each of the communities. And we can see here that they guided and informed all visual information. So we did this through formative evaluation. We'd get, have everyone come together. We'd give them some materials. And they'd essentially go through it, give us comments and feedback. We have weekly meetings where they continue to work through the materials. This was then presented at internal and external advisory boards. So this material went through a lot of renditions. If you can imagine starting out something simple as keeping it grayscale and highlighting a data point that's theirs, to then incorporating shape, to then incorporating some color to then have shape, color, and blot everything here. We ended up agreeing upon a visualization, which I'll show in a little bit. But the other big thing was framing the data. 
So how do you know, right, if this is something of concern? Well, what we did is we asked them, how do you use your rainwater? And with that, we note, uh, based on how they use the rainwater, we selected standards. And so here you can see these are the existing standards for water in, our, in the United States. Uh, primarily, there is no standard for these elements and uh, contaminants in rainwater. So we compared them to drinking water because some participants do want to drink their uh, harvested rainwater. People fill swimming pools with it, so we have the surface water standards if you were going to swim in a lake or river. And then we also have livestock and poultry because they were giving it to their um, animals. And so here's what, uh, you know, you can imagine this is the final rendition of that visualization after going about 12 uh, different versions with the promotoras. You can see here we're highlighting the rainwater sample in comparison to the field blank that they collected. So they could see right away if there had been any in, uh, form of contamination while sampling. We can then see the comparative values in the purple and the bluish line here. And the yellow line represented the limit of detection of the instrument that we used to detect that. Uh, element, which was critical to also have in a discussion about scientific methods. And so this was what the, uh, it, within the booklet, we not only, we explained each of the standards and also explained how to read this, uh, the uh, graphic itself. And as always, right, you want to make sure that you provide strategies uh, for reducing exposure. So you can't just give the data without actually giving uh, ways to reduce their exposure and ways to get more information. So these are some examples of that material. And also within Project Harvest in their booklet, they were given a chart that said, if you were above this value, what should you do? And so immediately, right when they got their data, they could see their point, compare it to the reference standards provided, compare it to other members, compare it to the other other community members in their uh, vicinity or in their community, and then go to see what action they need to take. And all of that was within and contained within the booklet, and we then had a focus group to discuss if they had any further questions or needed any more assistance with interpretation. And so here's highlighting, this is a big team for Project Harvest. I'm highlighting Dorsey Kaufman. Uh, we work very closely and work together on the data visualizations and information design. And massive thanks to all the participants of Garden Roots and Project Harvest over the years because this work is, they provide the research question and they work, uh, we work to, on this together and I'm very thankful and honored to uh, be welcomed in their community to address these issues. Thank you. The work of Monica and her community highlights the power of relevance. We're much more likely to use data if we think it impacts us, our families, or our communities. But how do we make something as large and abstract as climate change relevant? This is the question asked by our final speaker, Nadia Popovich. Nadia is a visual and data reporter on the New York Times climate team. Her work has won many awards, including two Emmys for innovative approaches to digital storytelling. Please join me in watching Nadja's presentation on personalizing climate change, which she gave at a data visualization conference at the Exploratorium called Visualize. Hi, my name is Nadia Popovich, uh, and I'm a graphics editor on the New York Times climate team. Uh, specifically, I tend to work on what I would classify as explanatory visuals. And the goal of my work uh, quite often is to translate, uh, visually translate science for a broad non-expert audience. And I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes talking about um, a project that I worked on last year, and more broadly about personalization in data visualization, and how that is able to help readers uh, form a deeper connection to sometimes abstract data. So the project was called How, Hot, uh, How Much Hotter Is Your Hometown Than When You Were Born? And it was a project I did in collaboration with some other uh, colleagues in the Times Graphics Department. Um, and the idea for this project really came from the fact that, well, as somebody who spends a majority of their time now thinking about and visualizing climate-related data, I've come to realize that no matter how we visualize it, it tends to be something that feels uh, rather abstract to a lot of our readers. Um, and I think that's true not just for Times readers, but for many people. I think that climate change can feel like something very far away in both time and space. So this is one of the first graphics I made when I started this job at the Times. Um, the maps use data from the Yale Center for Climate Change Communication, uh, which has been polling Americans on what they think about climate change, various different questions, for a long time now. 
uh, in the map. On your left, it says um, it shows that a majority of people in the country, in most counties in the country, say that global warming will harm people in the United States. Yet, at the same time, the other map shows that uh, not a majority of people in all those same counties say that global warming will harm me personally. And I think these maps really show how even among people who uh, say that climate change really will have big impacts and is a big deal, that uh, those impacts don't necessarily feel immediate or personal. So at the beginning of last year, I really set a goal to figure out how we could bring some of the effects of climate change a little bit closer to home for our readers uh, using data visualization. And so the question is, how do you do that? Um, and so to answer that question, I want to take a step back and talk about approaches to personalizing data narratives uh, more broadly. So I think that online, using interactive graphics, we are uniquely able to do something we weren't really able to do before um, in static graphics and definitely not in print newspapers. And I think that we're able to make our readers active participants in a data story. Um, oftentimes, we're even able to put the reader at the center of their own unique story, or you know, at least a unique-ish story, in order to get across some broader idea. And so one of the ways we do that is through location or geography. Uh, this is an example, uh, is an article from my colleagues at the Upshot. Uh, the colors look a little bit neon up there, but um, it's based on a national data set that looks at income mobility for children of families of different in different income brackets. Uh, but the article doesn't start by showing you this big zoomed out national data set, like the whole country, here are some patterns. Uh, instead, it actually detects where you are based, I'm pretty sure, on your IP address and centers the story in this very zoomed in view uh, there. So if you're in San Francisco right now and you go to this article page, this is what you're gonna get as the top of your story. Um, and by doing this, you're immediately brought a little bit closer to the data. You have, the reader has a more intimate and more human connection to it. Um, you're able to see, okay, that's San Francisco, and you can immediately start comparing it to the rest of the counties around it, Alameda, Contra Costa, et cetera. A second way that we personalize data narratives is through demographics that allow the reader to really see themselves reflected in a data set. Um, this is from a piece that I did at The Guardian for the 2014 midterm elections, uh, which seems like ages ago now. Uh, and in it, you're able to click through these buttons uh, to really see different demographic groups in Congress. Um, so rather than just make some charts that say presented the percentage of women in the new Congress versus the percentage of women in the United States, which I actually did below this graphic, um, I really decided to center this piece around the reader. And I think that you-centric uh, framing gives the reader a new and more intimate relationship to this data set. Here's another example from Nathan Yao, who I believe is here at this conference. Um, the title says it all. <laughs> Uh, this is a simulation of all the ways someone like you dies in America. Uh, and the you can be changed based on gender, race, and age. So lastly, I think another way we can personalize is through engagement. Um, so this is by letting the user become an active participant rather than a passive consumer of an article. This is another graphic that is actually a you draw it game, again from the upshot. Um, and they ask users to actively engage and take a guess at the trend for how family income predicts children's college chances. And then you get this reveal, uh, which gives a kind of personal explanation of the trend that you're looking at. It tells you how you did compared to other times readers, what part of the trend you maybe got right, what part you didn't, um, before really walking you through the broader idea. And so each of these graphics, which I just showed really briefly, um, they use one or some combination of these three strategies for personalizing a data story. So either location, demographics, and or engagement. Uh, but I think each of them has a similar intention, um, or at least from my point of view, because I'm not the author of all of those. Um, and the intention is twofold. So the first is to humanize data by bringing it a little bit closer to the reader's actual lived experience. 
And the second is to create a deeper, more active sense of engagement with a data set, um, and hopefully to parlay that into a deeper understanding of what you're trying to show the reader. So these were my two intentions as well when I took on the project of personalizing climate data. Uh, and specifically, I wanted to focus on one of the you know, most basic impacts of climate change, which is heat. So this is actually a graphic I made last year that shows 2017 was the second hottest year on record. And we tend to make a graphic like this every year, kind of putting into context for our readers uh, the news that comes out usually every January of how hot that year was compared to the past. But in whatever form it takes, you know, this is like not a very personal view. Uh, and this is the view of climate change we get most often. It's very zoomed out, it's global, uh, which is probably fair. This is a global problem. Um, and this graphic certainly does a good job, at least I think it does, of conveying its point, which is that overall the world is warming. Um, but again, I think it can feel rather abstract. I mean, even this idea of annual global surface temperature, that's just not how most people experience the world. But you know, we're able to make the, this same data set less abstract even just by putting it on a map. So this is very similar data, um, but no longer averaged across the entire world. Instead, it shows temperature anomalies at each location. And you can clearly see that global warming hasn't been equally spread across the world. And the effects of it aren't going to be equally spread either in the future. So this kind of data exists for future projections as well. Um, this is a graphic from the fifth assessment report of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and it shows what it says up there. So the annual mean surface air temperature change uh, by the year 2100. Uh, and it's from a series of different models. And these kinds of projections, this is again from the IPCC, another graphic. Uh, these kinds of projections are often made out to the year 2100. But when I was thinking about this personalization project uh, and talking through it with my colleagues, we really kept coming back to this idea that, you know, like that's just, again, something that feels quite distant. It's not necessarily uh, something that is like at the time span most of us think on. So we wanted to experiment instead with framing uh, this project really around a reader's lifetime. So can we show a reader how the world has warmed so far in their lifetime? We know we have that data. We know we can do it. Um, and then can we also truncate it to show them more specifically how um, heat could change in the future within their lifespan. And then the last thing I really thought a lot about was um, what exactly the right metric was to show, because this graphic, like many of the other ones that I've shown so far, really look at this like global average surface temperature or even just average surface temperature in a location. Um, but like I said, that's not really how people experience the world, even in their own place. Um, so I thought back to this other project I had done the year previously, uh, which I worked on with my colleague Brad Plumer. And it used data from a group called Climate Impact Lab. And what they did is instead of looking at average surface temperature, they counted uh, what they considered extremely hot days. So these were days over 95 degrees and how these could change over time. And we ended up mapping it like this in the piece. Um, but I, I just really liked this metric. I kept thinking about it um, because I think it felt a lot more tangible. All of us really know what a 95 degree day feels like. It's one of those days that is just scorchingly hot. You know, maybe you don't want to go outside. You want to stay in the air conditioning. Um, and it's also at these extremes that uh, we really see some of the greatest impacts of climate change, not at the average. So I thought this was also an important metric. So I got in back in touch with the folks at Climate Impact Lab and asked them if they'd be interested in taking on a new, more detailed analysis that we could base this project on. And to my great uh, happiness, they said yes. So I want to now just walk you through this project. I can figure out how. Uh, OK, so this is the project. How much hotter is your hometown than when you were born? And I'm going to speed through this a little bit. Um, but basically, you come to the screen where it's mostly blank. You get just this prompt to enter your hometown and birth year. So I'm going to put in my hometown, which is Washington, DC. And I'm going to type in a. 
birth year that gives us a nice data set. Um, and we immediately draw on this line where we tell people, okay, when you were born, the Washington area could expect about 13 days per year to reach at least 90 degrees. Um, and I want to just point out two things. One is that um, this line we're drawing in is actually a 21-year rolling average based around the year that you were born. It's not exactly the data within the year because, again, we're talking about climate here, not weather. And so we wanted to make sure that if you happened to be born in a year that was like really hot or uh, anomalously cold, you didn't get a completely skewed answer. Um, and we hint at this in the text in that it says, you know, the Washington area could expect about 13 days. We don't tell people that it was exactly the count that year. Um, and so uh, we give you just that hint. And then as you scroll through the piece, uh, we draw on the rest of the line and we tell you that today the Washington area can expect 30 days. So you already see that within your lifetime there has been some warning. We go from 13 to 30 days. And on the third scroll, we really zoom out and actually change the entire scale of what you're looking at on the y-axis um, to show you that it, what might happen in the future. So we tell you that by the time you're 80, and we say 80 because 79 is actually the uh, life expectancy in the US, and we're just rounding. So models show there could be 50 of these very hot days. And then we give a likely range because, of course, you know, talking about future, uh, we don't want to give like a false specificity. And um, through this like three-step process, we introduce people to this completely, I think, different way of looking at a climate-related data set than they're usually used to. And I think it has this real power of putting you at the center of the story that you're usually used to seeing in a really zoomed out view. Um, and then I go on to just explain a little bit more about the data set here before we get to a second graphic, um, which I think is actually really important as a counterbalance to this sort of personalization. So here in this globe, we actually take you back to that zoomed out view, the one that you're actually probably more used to seeing, to point back at the idea that this is something that is global and interconnected. And so you see Washington already in the context of the rest of the United States. Here we remind you what's going on. You see it in the context of Latin America, et cetera. Um, we actually here are no longer in the personal view, so we're talking about the full data set, which goes from 1960 to the end of the century. And then we take users on a little uh, tour as well. So we take them to uh, the tropics, so Jakarta, Indonesia, and show how that's going to be an area that sees some of the largest absolute increases in these extremely hot days. Uh, now it's not scrolling. <laughs> OK, well, um, the next slide, we actually take them also to India, um, where we explain that there are 22 million people in New Delhi and show how that is going to look. And then in the third part, we take you back to Madrid um, to explain that even in so even in temperate regions, um, you're going to see really large relative increases in these extremely hot days, even though you might not see absolute increases the way that you see in a place like Jakarta. Um, and what we wanted to accomplish with this map here is, again, to after we've given people this really close zoomed in view that helps them understand climate change compared to their own personal experience, I think that really gives them a better context in which they're able to understand the rest of the data set. They have a point of reference through which they can then understand Jakarta and New Delhi and what's going on in Madrid a little bit closer in a way that I don't think that when you just give a zoomed out map where someone kind of has to start exploring and thinking through it themselves, they just might not have that same connection. And uh, I think that that is something that is really powerful about this kind of graphic that really focuses on the reader's own experience rather than just presenting them with a big zoomed out data set. Um, and I'd glad to be take to take any questions about this project afterwards, the Q&A. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you again for joining me tonight to think about how we might go from data to action. I hope the three presentations gave you a new sense of the kind of data that we collect to understand our world. We're really in an extraordinary time. We're facing a pandemic and ongoing racial and environmental injustice. Data can be one of the tools that we use to address these critical issues. Data can show us where disease outbreaks are. It can show who's being disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and environmental toxins.
data can show us where our wool is warming fastest and who may be most affected. It is important that we then use this data to act or force others to act to improve our own health, the health of our communities and the health of our planet. Thank you again for taking the time to consider these important issues and better understand data and how it can lead to action. Please be well.